person who donated Ospenskaya's papers to UCLA. I thought maybe a mix-up with the names had occurred. Mama Mac, as the students called her, had been the teaching assistant in an English class for foreign students at Columbia University. Ospenskaya was taking the class and got McLean hired as the diction instructor at the American Laboratory Theater. When Ospenskaya moved her school to Hollywood, McLean came along with her. In Hollywood, she also worked for the studios, coaching actors on accents they needed for parts or helping actors get rid of regional speech patterns. After Ospenskaya's death, McLean taught at UCLA. Margaret McLean did not have a daughter who could have brought the papers to UCLA and which may have explained the mix-up with the names. Bob Abbott, Ospenskaya's heir, would have inherited her personal papers. Robert Abbott was Ospenskaya's personal manager, and I had seen his name in some of the newspaper articles and gossip columns in Ospenskaya's archives. He escorted her to parties and events. Like Margaret McLean, Bob Abbott had known Ospenskaya in New York and had later moved to Los Angeles. Both Bob Abbott and Margaret McLean would have known what image Ospenskaya wanted in her archives. Maybe Bob Abbott knew someone named Elizabeth McKean who helped him with the papers.
Before she left New York, Ospenskaya asked if she could use her own interpretation for the character, and Weiler wrote back, You may do whatever you want with the part. Her five-minute scene was said to be one of the reasons the supporting category was established that year for the Academy Awards. After Ospenskaya finished filming her part and was on her way back to New York, newspapers told the story of what had happened to her in Hollywood. As soon as she checked into her hotel, half of Hollywood was bombarding her with phone calls for coaching or consultations. The studio refused to accept calls for her, and she had to hide out in an obscure retreat and disconnect the phone. In Los Angeles, a reporter had asked her what was next, and she said she was going east to her summer headquarters in New England for student plays, then the fall term, which will bring new faces. The script wasn't finished and Ospenskaya's scenes were delayed for two months. After her scenes were filmed, Ospenskaya wasn't released for three months in case retakes were needed. She had to make two quick trips back to New York during Conquest because of complaints about her long absence from the school. Memberships were also good at their other club, the Surf and Sand. This may have been how she discovered Hermosa Beach, where she rented an oceanfront cottage. Ospenskaya said she preferred swimming in the ocean. She told her students to go to the beach and listen to the waves and smell the ocean. She put an emphasis on bringing the five senses to a character. She found it difficult to sleep and read movie magazines at night. If the weather was warm enough, she'd go out in the ocean at midnight. Conquest was released in late 1937 and was MGM's greatest financial loss between 1920 and 1949. The critics said that the movie was flat when Ospenskaya wasn't in it. When Ginger Rogers found out Ospenskaya was assigned to a small regulation dressing room, she insisted that Ospenskaya move into her star dressing room suite. One of her friends went to the press preview at the Pantages Theater and told her that people were asking, who was she? No one recognized her from Dodsworth. This could have been why she was nominated again for an Academy Award. The 
before leaving New York, Ospenskaya spent a week with Grand Duchess Marie, a Russian emigre who was an authority on India, learning about the customs and mannerisms that would help her portray the Maharani. All of Ospenskaya's part was filmed on a soundstage. She said that she tried to smell and hear the rain and tried to be conscious of all the activities of a great palace. References to Ospenskaya stealing the movie appeared in the press. This was not deliberate scene stealing like some actors engaged in at that time, but was just the result of her acting ability. In 1939, all the studios were trying to get Ospenskaya into a movie. She wouldn't sign a long-term contract because in Russia she had to play every part assigned to her and she wanted to vary her roles. Friends attended a birthday party for her at the end of July, and during the summer, Ospenskaya decided to move her school to Hollywood.
was a superman, but he could die. He was a superman who couldn't fly. He was in love with a vampire. Admission to the school was by interview, which was delegated to an assistant. If it seemed important to the person, they got in. The students were asked to call her Madame. She coached private students in the early morning or on Sundays. These were already established actors who wanted help with a particular part. Her agent also used her to coach new actors and make their screen tests to show to producers. At the school, Ospenskaya personally taught the class called the Technique of Acting. She entered the room with two assistants and sat down at a table that had a glass of water on it. A student in Jane Russell's class tasted it when Ospenskaya was out of the room, and it was vodka. She smoked during class. She even smoked when she was swimming in the ocean. She went through five or six packs of Lucky Strikes a day and continued to smoke the more exotic-looking Russian cigarettes. Ospenskaya believed that having complete muscle control of the body was an important part of an actor's training, and the students were given instruction by a former member of the Petrograd Imperial Ballet of Russia. Jane Russell recalled Ospenskaya going from room to room observing the movement and dance classes. In Jane Russell's autobiography, she wrote that Madame often did handstands in class. I think this came from her research for The Cherry Orchard. The character she played had a tragic background as a child acrobat and Ospenskaya joined a children's acrobatics class so she could relate to the character. On Fridays, the students chose scenes, sins, as Ospenskaya called them, which were prepared over the weekend and presented in class on Monday. Ospenskaya didn't hesitate to point out when something was phony. Some students viewed her as being tough on them, but she thought it was pointless if she didn't tell them what they were doing wrong. In the early 1940s, Ospenskaya was asked to write a book on acting. She turned down the offer because, as she told her friend Dean Goodman, she didn't think there were any fixed rules in art. She believed acting training should be in person and she didn't want to give actors a blueprint that promised results.
Well, Spenskaya told her students to go to the zoo and study the animals. They had more primitive emotions than humans and were more unpredictable. Students portrayed animals in class. Ospenskaya thought this made them more uninhibited and helped them break away from conventional ways of movement. Besides the animal exercises, students would be told to portray things like seaweed in the ocean, a melting ice cream cone, or a thread going through the eye of a needle. The second year, students learned about play production. Ospenskaya rented the Wilshire Ebell Theater for public performances of the student plays. Then they took the productions to local high schools and colleges. Marie Windsor, interviewed later in life, recalled the contingent of agents who frequented Ospenskaya's and said that one of these agents brought Marie and some other girls to a party in the Hollywood Hills. These con men, moochers, spongers, and small-time crooks arrived in a town that had a corrupt mayor and where reports to the police often weren't followed up. Hollywood had cultivated a reputation at this time for having a lot of money sitting around. I found several newspaper clippings in Ospenskaya's archives about how she was paid either $750 or $850 a day with a contract for at least 21 days of work, which was a lot of money in the 30s and 40s. Sometimes stories like this were PR, but they were in the papers, and everyone read newspapers back then. Many businesses were subject to extortion at that time. The Hollywood Brown Derby, nightclubs such as the Mo Combo, and also smaller businesses like bakeries. It was very common for someone to come around for protection money. Otherwise, the business was in danger of fires, broken windows, stink bombs, or thugs being sent to hassle the customers. It wasn't until the 1950s that the police in L.A. started getting tough on these con artists by taking them up to Coldwater Canyon or Mulholland Drive, putting a gun to their heads and telling them to get out of town. After being on Vine Street for almost a year and a half, Ospenskaya moved the school to Sunset Boulevard, a few blocks west of La Brea. William Wilkerson, who founded the trade paper that was located here, also owned the famous nightclubs, the Trocadero and Ciro's, on the Sunset Strip. Wilkerson paid so much in extortion money for the Trocadero that a suspicious kitchen fire gave him an excuse to sell the business. Wilkerson also had to get out of Ciro's after a few years because of the expensive payoffs and concerns about food and supplies being held up or sabotaged if the payments did not continue. Ciro stayed in business until 1957, but the new owner had to pay off Mickey Cohen, who controlled the extortion racket on the Sunset Strip. The nightclubs were a big part of the Hollywood social scene.
Some people believed that being successful in Hollywood was based on social connections or getting their name in the newspaper. Victorville already had a connection to Hollywood. A guest ranch called the North Verde Ranch, which was a secret getaway for stars looking for privacy, solitude, or a place for clandestine affairs. Ospenskaya's ranch was mentioned in articles and clippings in her archives, how she loved the desert and went out there every possible weekend. She said she hated driving a car, so she was chauffeured to Victorville. She kept a couple of horses at the ranch that she rode, and she liked taking early morning walks in the desert. There was nothing in the archives about where the ranch was located in Victorville. No address, no paperwork related to it, no photographs of it. I contacted the city of Victorville, and they told me that since Victorville wasn't incorporated as a city until 1962, the records would be in San Bernardino, the county seat. Using a link they sent, I searched for property records under Ospenskaya's name and came up with no results. Later, when I was searching on newspapers.com for Bob Abbott in Hollywood, an article came up about the Bob Abbott Ranch in Victorville. When I did a computer search for Bob Abbott in Victorville, I found a reference to a street, Abbott Street. Ospenskaya said in an interview that her ranch was about seven miles from Victorville, and Abbott Street is 7.2 miles from where downtown Victorville had been in the 1940s. There's almost nothing left of the old downtown from the 30s and 40s. The city developed away from it. The tract of houses around Abbott Street was built in 2006. I got to thinking that Ospinskaya never owned property in Hollywood. She always lived in apartments. Even the house in Whitley Heights was described in a story about her as an apartment high on a hillside near the Hollywood Bowl. Around that time, houses sometimes had a separate unit, often over a garage, that the owners rented out. So my theory is that Bob Abbott rented or leased a section of the ranch to her. Many ranches already had outbuildings on the property that someone could live in. Uh -huh. 
Ospinskaya coached her student, Dean Goodman, for a part in a play at the Geller Workshop on Wilshire Boulevard. Marlena Dietrich's daughter, Maria, was a teacher at the workshop. Dean later concluded that the 18-year-old Maria was looking for someone to marry, to get away from home and from her mother.
1942, John Garfield, Ospenskaya's former student, founded the Hollywood Canteen with Betty Davis. Ospenskaya was one of the volunteers who served food, gave autographs, and visited with members of the military on leave in Southern California. Ospenskaya was also part of the Hollywood Victory Committee, founded to support the war effort. They coordinated war bond tours, USO shows, and visits to military camps. There may have been other war-related secret activities going on, with the references to confidentiality and protection, but Ospenskaya's involvement is not known. By January 1943, many of Ospenskaya's students and staff members were in the military, and she decided to close her school. According to the book Stanislavski in America, the move to Hollywood stunted her teaching. The new environment was filled with hurdles and uncertainty. Many of the staff later recalled the, quote, immoral atmosphere at the school. Perhaps the extortion had followed her to the Sunset Boulevard location, and she used the war as an excuse to shut down the business. By the end of 1943 and into 1944, Ospenskaya was writing letters to her agent, Paul Koner, telling him that she was desperate for a job and was being ignored for parts. Ospenskaya told Dean Goodman that she had disagreed with Mervyn Leroy's direction during Waterloo Bridge. He wanted her role played as a total bitch and she wanted to show another side to the character. Ospenskaya went to the head of the studio, who told her she would be replaced unless she followed Leroy's direction. It took a while, but Ospenskaya became ostracized for being difficult. Also, actresses like Greta Garbo and Myrna Loy wouldn't work with her again because of the supposed scene-stealing. She found a new agent and did get parts in a few movies during the latter part of her career. It is my belief that Joan Crawford was privately coached by Ospenskaya for Mildred Pierce. They knew each other. After Crawford left MGM, she knew that her future in Hollywood depended on finding the right part and giving the best performance she possibly could. Critics wrote about the depth of her acting in Mildred Pierce. I believe the same thing had happened with Ginger Rogers a few years earlier. Rogers wanted to break away from the musicals with Fred Astaire, by showing she could excel in a dramatic role. I was shocked when I read an article that was written after Ospenskaya closed her school on Sunset Boulevard. It described a little girl coming to Ospenskaya's apartment for her first lesson in dramatics. Ospenskaya was telling the little girl to look at roses, Notice that every rose is different. Notice that every rose is different every day. This was shocking to me because Ospenskaya always said that she would never accept children as students. They had to be at least 16. I did not know that Ospenskaya was supposed to be in the movie The Heiress. I found an article on newspapers.com that said that she had been signed to play the important role of Madame Talma, 
the fashionable Parisian dressmaker who creates Olivia de Havilland's trousseau. But Ospenskaya is not in the movie, nor is that character played by someone else. According to the woman who wrote the screenplay, Weiler had to push de Havilland and give her a lot of attention because he knew she couldn't do the part. The disappearance of Ospenskaya from the film may have been another case of being afraid of drawing attention away from the star, like Garbo and Myrna Loy. Dean Goodman, Ospenskaya's assistant, was friends with a lady who was taking lessons at the school, Lillian Fontaine, who was de Havilland's mother. Mrs. Fontaine would have been well aware of Ospenskaya's knowledge of acting. Ospenskaya opened a new school in 1947 and was teaching there at the time of her death. I found an interview from 1977 with Dean Goodman. By that time, he was an actor, writer, and teacher in San Francisco. In the interview, he said that he was working on a novel about a movie star from the 30s and 40s who was getting death threats. Death threats often accompanied extortions. Maybe when Ospenskaya opened the new school, there was an attempt to take a cut of the business and she couldn't afford to pay it. The article about her estate indicated that she was living from paycheck to paycheck. There also could have been someone who blamed Ospenskaya for something that went wrong in their life or career. The threats may have been a reason Inez Simons, a friend and former student, was staying at Ospenskaya's apartment on the night of the fire. I found an online obituary for Inez Simons. She died in 2002, lived in New York City and Hollywood, worked as a secretary for movie star Maria Ospenskaya. Interests included theater and acting. I was able to track down her niece in Oregon, who told me Inez had never mentioned the fire to her. The niece said I would have remembered that. After graduating from the University of Oregon, Inez moved to New York City where she attended Ospenskaya's school, and in 1939 she followed Madame to Hollywood. The obituary mentioned a marriage, and the niece told me it was a weird relationship that lasted two weeks. He was a theater professional with a Ph.D. who was later affiliated with the Shakespeare in Central Park, the New York Public Theater, and the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Inez's niece said that she had been on a TV show, but the niece didn't remember the name of it. In an article on newspapers.com from her hometown newspaper in 1957, I found out the show was a pilot for a series of educational films. She had also been writing TV newscast scripts for Channel 11 in Los Angeles. Her niece told me Inez had left behind a painting by Ospenskaya and a box of pencils from Ospenskaya's last school. Her obituary said that Inez returned to Oregon in 1970 worked as a caregiver, and her niece told me she didn't talk very much about her life in Hollywood. At the time, the cause of Ospenskaya's death, as reported in the newspapers, was smoking in bed, which could have been what happened. No one investigated the fire. They just assumed that was how she died but I discovered later sources that seemed to question this, using words like allegedly died from, probably died from, reportedly, it was said that. Someone wrote on Ospenskaya's Find a Grave page, someday you'll know about the fire that took your life. 
Another mysterious Hollywood death took place two years earlier, and it was someone Ospenskaya knew. The costume designer for the two Wolfman movies was found floating in her swimming pool in North Hollywood. A suicide note was left behind that said she was being blackmailed. It had been going on for 23 years, ever since she was hired by Universal Studios. She had recently left her position as head designer for Universal and was designing a collection for a boutique in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. According to an online story, Vera West may have been bought off to leave. A new administration took over the studio at this time. Was the underworld involved in some nefarious ring at the studio? Did Vera have to be silenced because she knew something dangerous? Was her suicide note planted? Was the handwriting Vera's? The suicide note mentions a fortune teller. Was this a reference to Ospenskaya's part in the Wolfman movies? Ospenskaya had an interest in astrology. She was one of the clients of Carol Ryder, the astrology columnist for the L.A. Times. Jack West, Vera's husband, was away at the time she drowned. They had argued because Vera wanted a divorce. He may have been financially dependent on his wife and afraid that a divorce would leave him with nothing. Jack West told police that Vera was not being blackmailed, but someone commenting on this story thought the payment could have been her designs, compromising photographs, or other sexual things. After Vera died, Jack West sold the property in the valley and vanished. The coroner may have suspected that a drug had been put into something Vera drank before she was placed in the pool, because the coroner wouldn't sign the death certificate until toxicology tests were completed. This was the last newspaper article about Vera's death. Apparently, the case was dropped at this point. <laughs> The bedroom window could have been unlocked ahead of time, and when Ospenskaya was believed to be asleep, a lighted cigarette or match could have been thrown onto the bed. One of the newspaper articles reported that Inez Simons heard Ospenskaya screaming. Inez beat out the flames and called Ospenskaya's doctor, whose practice was in North Hollywood. The doctor treated Ospenskaya at her apartment, then drove her to St. Joseph Hospital in Burbank. Because she had no insurance, she was transferred to the Motion Picture Relief Home in Woodland Hills. Her doctor was with her when she died a few days later from a stroke that was attributed to shock. According to the coroner's office, she was 68 when she died in her 80s, according to her friend Dean Goodman.
On newspapers.com, one of the sources said she was 84. A collection had to be taken up to cover the funeral expenses and buy the grave marker with the flattering birth year.